So electrical power is transmitted by cables over long distances at very high voltages. Now, if you recall, they haven't mentioned it in the question, but this question is specifically asking about transformers or why do you use transformers? What are the effects of using high voltage in a transmission system? Now, the reason why you use it in a transmission system, and they're talking about transmission like power delivery, right? From the station to, you know, uh, power lines essentially, which take it to cities and towns, right? So why do you use this trans um, transformer is because the electricity needs to travel in wires over really, really long distances, right? So here's like an example, here's a power station and here's a transmission cable. Power goes here and they keep on going on these cheap poles, right? And they'll go to a city and yeah. So you want, what you want to do is you want to minimize power. So power coming in or electricity coming in over here will cause a decent or significant amount of um, power loss that would that's no good right you understand why that's not good and this is you know like a house uh, where a person is in uh, and they're trying to uh, you know charge their phone right so what they do is how do you minimize this power loss what they do is over here they'll put a transformer right and i'm like i'm just you know think of this as a flow chart rather than an actual diagram they're using a transformer which steps up the voltage takes the voltage and steps it up step you call it a step up transformer trans right what it does is the voltage becomes really high and the current traveling in the um, wire becomes really low now that's more about like how a transformer works, but it ends up doing that. And once it does that, the high voltage and low current going through this, the power, you know, more or less remains the same, but because there's a shift in how the electricity is working over here, there's a significant decrease in power loss. So power losses due to resistance go down. Power loss is reduced when you need to, um, yeah, so power loss is reduced over here. Now the problem is that this voltage is not usable for most people. So I think it's in the tens of thousands. It's probably 20,000 or something, right? You need your 220 volts. What they do is at the end, right before it reaches the con consumer, they put a step down transformer to convert it into the same voltage. So here's a step down transformer and they put it here so the voltage comes back down so there will be power losses in the wires again but because there's not a lot of wire from the transformer because you notice they're very close to homes and offices so it's not too big of a deal it beats the you know hundreds of kilometers of power uh, wires that are used and, that's, and that also allows you to use thin wires right because the power lines are very thick, you know, if, you, if you've never noticed underground ones, right? But these wires, these poles carrying wires, or like these current carrying wires are very thin. And these transformers allow it. Long story short, what's essentially happening is, after me explaining all that, is that the power losses in the cables are is obviously at a minimum, right? And the current in the system is also at a minimum because that's how power transmission systems work. That's why you end up using a transformer. Uh, this makes sense? Let's move on. A potential divider is connected across the terminals of a six volt supply. So, well, here's a six volt supply, two resistors, two voltages across them in parallel. When R is adjusted to six, ohms the voltage in the readings v1 and v2 are equal what happens to the readings when the resistance of r is then increased so they're equal and they're equal so the resistance 
this is increased. If this is higher resistance, if this is increased, what's going to happen is the voltage across this one will also increase. The voltage drop will increase. And the voltage drop relatively will decrease over here because the most there's only a finite amount of voltage and that can be divided amongst these resistors. The higher this is, the more this will contribute to that drop. So the voltage will automatically decrease. And you can work it out. It's not a difficult question. You can also work it out. Um, pretend this is like 10 or 12 or something. And let me just write it. Let's say this is 12 and you can easily work it out. And you'll realize that the voltage two will increase but voltage one will decrease. So our answer is B. A length of copper wire is labeled length 30 meter and diameter 0 0.5 millimeter. Which instruments are most suitable to measure accurately the length and the diameter of the wire? Now a lot of people I think got this question wrong because they prefer rule because they're thinking well I have a ruler and if I used it, I know how to use the ruler, right? And if there was a wire in front of me, I would just use the ruler because I'm, you know, more familiar with it. And what, what's tape? Or do they mean measuring tape? Like, we, we don't even know, right? But if you were slightly more experienced in measuring lengths of wires and you had a long wire in front of you and you had all of these instruments in front of you, you wouldn't even pick any of these to measure the length, you would just simply pick up a measuring tape. Why? Because it's just way easier because there are two problems with the rule. Like, because you, you won't have a really long uh, ruler, which is 30 meters long. 30 meters is like, you know, uh, I'm like two meters tall, like close to two meters tall and I'm six feet. So probably 15 of me in a, in a line lying down flat in a line so that's pretty long right a tall guy sitting you know 15 of those that's pretty long you so if you take the ruler and you keep putting it over and over again you'll have issues with the measurement because you won't be extremely sure that you're using the same ruler like you're positioning it correctly over and over again but a tape could be that long tapes are generally because they're wound together uh, they're really that long and you can easily measure it and that's what most people use in um, uh, professions where they need such things right now comes the thickness now the thickness is very tiny you want to be accurate about it and it's very like tiny like you know what a millimeter is right like you've seen a scale right that's half of that millimeter like if this was a ruler this would be one centimeter from like zero to one right with those lines this is one millimeter and you're looking at 0 0.5 millimeters if you've ever seen a vernier caliper yeah it won't be that accurate but micrometers they'll be way more accurate so your correct answer is d now i could talk about ranges of these things but you know you just develop an intuition like oh you see like a you know like a uh, car and you want to measure its length what do you use of course you're not going to use a, a ruler right you're going to lay lay the tape on the floor in front of the car and figure it out right because it just works better that way anyway let's move on okay so a car has stopped at a red light. When the light changes to green, the car starts moving with a constant acceleration. The graph represents this motion. Which quantity is plotted on the x-axis and which quantity is plotted on the y-axis? Let's take a look at a car that's um, accelerating at let's say five meter per second per second right what would well, there's no point talking about the acceleration graph what would its uh, velocity look like so velocity obviously is going to be zero 
is going to start at zero. And velocity, if the acceleration is constant, the velocity will constant constantly <coughs> increase, right? The velocity, it'll get faster and faster at the same rate. So that's what acceleration means. So this means the velocity is increasing by five every second, right? Another way of looking at um, acceleration is actually is actually five meter per second per second, right? Does that make sense? It's trying to say the velocity of five meter per second is changing every second. And that's what this means, like, or you could just go simplify it and just write it like that. But this is what they're trying to say. And this is what acceleration is generally, like, as to the rate of change of velocity, if that's constant. So the velocity is increasing. And if we have some little knowledge of something, a graph that starts with zero and increases by five at every increment of, you know, the x-axis, it's gonna pretty look pretty, a lot like a straight line, right? That's the velocity versus the time graph. That doesn't look like the velocity time graph. But, so every second the velocity is increasing, if you notice, it was zero. So let's take a look at the same car. But let's take a look at its uh, displacement or distance, right? How it's changing, right? So first, it doesn't do too much because it starts at zero. But early on, over here, if you notice, it has very little velocity. So the distance is going to change, but it's going to be really small, kind of like that. But by the time it gets here, it's, the velocity is slowly increasing of the car. It's getting faster and faster. So the change of distance is going to get higher and higher, right? For the same amount of time, let's say that's the first time increment, the second time increment, third time increment, fourth time increment. Let's say it increased by this much, right? In the second increment, it needs to increase by slightly faster, right? That's how fast it increases. And because in the third increment, it's, you know, the velocity is way higher. It's going to increase at a higher rate and then a higher rate. And I've drawn it poorly, but it would more or less look like a curve rising, right? Kind of like this, how this is shown. So they're talking about the y-axis is the, I was saying displacement, but I guess it's distance. And over here, this is time. Take a look at um, our answer. Well, uh, x has to be time, um, and y has to be the distance, right? And that's our answer. The answer is C. A workman rolls a barrel of weight 200 newtons up a plank of length 2 meters and onto a lorry. The bank of the lorry is 0. Point. Okay, just, you know, like pretty obvious. The diagram is better than the words here. What is the work done on the barrel against gravity? Okay. So it's uh, 2,000 newtons. I think I, I misspoke earlier. It wasn't, didn't say 2,000, but it's 2,000 newtons, right? And they're giving us a lot of things, but they're asking for one thing. What is the work done? So work has a direction in mind. Every time you talk about work, it's the direction in mind. What is the work done against gravity? Which direction is gravity? It's downward. So against gravity, can I say it's going to be this direction? So what is the work done in this direction? So work is the force multiplied by the distance traveled. Now the force needed to kind of like lift it is going to be equal to its weight times the distance it travels in the direction of the work that's being counted. Right, so what's the distance traveled? Well, it's 0 0.8, 0 0.8, 0 0.8, isn't that going to be 1600 uh, joules? Yeah, 1600 joules, B is our answer, right? 
and understand that they're asking for the work done against gravity so we're trying to f figure out everything there's probably more work done over here because they also moved it like that right but we're ignoring that because the question is limiting the work done again what was the word done in erasing that mark okay work done against gravity let's move on the angle of incidence of a ray op on the plane mirror mn is 40 degrees the mirror is rotated through 10 degrees as shown in the diagram so it's kind of this is the mirror and it's rotated like that where the dotted line is so you kind of like tilt it clockwise as we're seeing it the direction of the incident ray op does not change so the ray is the same and someone like oops sorry and you know knocks the mirror what is the new angle of incidence so what is this new angle so this is considered a right angle let me this is a right angle because it's normal this part poorly highlighted this is a right angle so wherever the mirror is the normal is just perpendicular to that mirror right so it's gonna be here somewhere the, well, that's probably not the best line somewhere like that so if this part moved 10 degrees is it got moved 10 degrees what's gonna to happen to the normal think about this think about this if you have like a 90 degree angle right and you move it kind of like that what's gonna to happen to this part will that also move 10 degrees if you move this 10 degrees yes so this is also going to move 10 degrees so what is the light isn't changing so what's the new angle is it 50 degrees yes it is it's 50 degrees blue and yellow are colors in the visible spectrum which color has the lower frequency and which color has the longer wavelength i these questions i kind of resort to this sort of mental image i have of the spectrum which you see in practically every book and you have like long radio waves over here you know implying that the uh, frequencies are really small like very uh, low frequency and over here you have like gamma rays and stuff let's just put gamma rays right and a very high frequency so let's put high over here and high frequency and let's change the color a bit low frequency right and in the middle you have somewhere your you have your visible spectrum and so it starts with red red and goes all the way up to violet or you know so it's red uh, orange yellow yeah green it's mostly green then you have you know a bit of blue and that's it right and this is a mental image i have so which color has a lower frequency and let's not worry about the wavelength yet uh, yet which of these has a lower frequency because yellow is on the extreme compared to blue extreme right the lower frequency side yellow has the lower frequency compared to uh, blue right so yellow wins right and longer wavelength well isn't uh, the formula for all of this is uh, isn't uh, frequency inversely proportional to wavelength so if something has high frequency it has low wavelength so if yellow has low wavelength it should have high uh, wavelength as well sorry lower frequency if yellow has lower frequency it has high wavelength is that the case so between them it's again yellow and the ultimate beautiful irony is i highlight yellow with blue right which color and red which color has the lower frequency well it's yellow and which color has the longer wavelength well it's yellow yeah compared to blue 
Let us move on and answer is D.